welcome to the Fort Lorraine Museum in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Uh, the museum is kind of in two halves. There's one half that's more of a historical pioneer, uh, you know, lots of buildings, lots of lots of old uh, stuff from the time when they were settling and, and building towns in the prairies and whatnot uh, from the fur trading era right up until uh, you know the 50s. So I'll look at that in a different video. But today we're looking over here, we're looking at the Alice Chalmers Museum because today they have a few units out. We're gonna see a few of them, uh, walk through the museum and sort of show you some of the pieces that are here. Things uh, that are unique about this year. One is that it is the 100th anniversary of the Gleaner Company and they made combines. And this museum I'm told is the largest indoor collection of Gleaner combines that we know of. So we'll check out some of those. Also, it is the 60th anniversary of the development of the D21 tractor, which is this guy right here. Now this is a unique one. And there's another one in this museum with a regular one, but this one was a front wheel assist, which was very rare. But we'll check out the pieces. We'll see what we can find out. So this is an Alice Chalmers WC with a Waukesha engine, and this is a bit of a conversion. You couldn't find them, couldn't afford them, so he decided he was going to build them. He took the oldest WC he has, which is a year more than, uh, I think it's a three, four, or five chassis, found a couple Waukesha engines and chopped it off the clutch housing, and you can see that right here. Okay. From here back is Alice, from here ahead is Waukesha. Oh my. So he <laughs> measured that all up, cut the thing, gave himself about an eighth or a quarter of an inch that he could fill in with weld, and then he lined everything up, which meant slipping that engine in and out of that thing, and he put in his own mounts as, as he could to get it lined up. But when he got the thing lined up to where he could slide it and that shaft was slipping back and forth easy, thought that was good enough, tacked the two housings together, welded the thing up, and fortunately it didn't warp that much, put it back in and slipped in. <laughs> but it was a quite a project. Do you know what year they made these? Well, the, the original Walker saws, I think we're only made one year. Was it 33? I think so. Okay, 1933. I think this is a 35 Until rear end, but you know, it, it, the engine was seized on it, so Gilbert thought this is the oldest one he had. He'd put the Waukesha engine in it. And then what, they so, went till 47? They're what? The WD came out in 48? Yeah, hmm. 47. They made an awful lot of copies of WCs. Uh, 178,000 or something WCs made. Right, right. So, so whose idea was it to put the Waukesha engine in this one versus what else were they using at the time? Well, Alice Chalmer came out with their own 201 engine, which is uh, the 4x4 square, the 4 inch bore, 4 inch stroke, okay. which was the, the W engine, which was used WC, WDs, WD45, they put a longer stroke in it. Okay. And it's sort of turned into the 17, 170s, a four-cylinder gas engine was basically grew out of the, the WC engine. So why the Waukesha then? Because they didn't have an engine ready to go. Oh. But these these are very rare. I, I, I don't know. There's not that many of them known to exist. Real ones especially. Got to turn on the gas. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe put some fuel to it. That's a 21, D21 front wheel assist. 
hydraulic brake. But it was not manufactured that way by Alice either. Alice did manufacture 10 of them, and they sent them out as prototypes, trial types, I don't know what you call them then, but they were to take them all back and put on the regular steering action. The rumors or the story is, or the fact, whichever you want to call it, that one guy said, no, I like it, it's my tractor, you're not getting it back. Collectors are still looking for that one. Okay. <laughs> and, so, uh, so this is not one no, of those prototypes? No, this is not one of those prototypes. It is very similar to it, but it is a Lully axle, and it's all Lully components, which were also used on some John Deere front wheel assists, and Oliver used the Lully system too. Okay. But somebody put this on, and they also, to get the gearing right or whatever, they also went to the bigger, higher tires on the back of it, which yes. most 21s came up with the 24 532s, a little bit shorter tire. These are the 20.838 tires. So, uh, which I don't even think were available when they quit making D21s. Okay. Okay. The rear, the rear, it, it was not in gear. Hmm. So those screw drives. So, so, so the front axle is completely independent from the yep. rear. No connection. Just your how you control it. Here. That's that's uh, that's the. Deal. Now this one I'm a little bit familiar with. This is a Model B Alice Chalmers. Uh, don't ask me the year, but I, I, I'm pretty sure this is the same one that I, uh, I've driven this one in a parade a couple times, way, way back when. Oh, here we go. Model B, 1938. Four-cylinder, three-speed transmission, pneumatic tires. Wow, it had a whole uh, 13 horsepower. I'm pretty sure my little garden tractor is, uh, well, it does, uh, 16 horsepower. <laughs> This is only 13. This one's got a little more weight, I'm guessing. And it's got a PTO and a pulley, or it had. I don't think it has. This one is equipped for 500 bucks. $500. I wish you could still buy a little tractor for $500. Mind you, back then, in the 30s, that was probably a small fortune. I'm pretty sure this is the power takeoff right here shifter this is your throttle there's a choke somewhere on this guy where is it well maybe there's not I believe your brakes were these levers here one for each side clutch down there and this guy has a little toolbox you put your tools and stuff in there Newer spreader. Uh, Two of them. 
front end manure spreader. Now that sounds on the surface to be an incredibly bad idea to throw the poop in front of you. Nineteen fifty-nine. This one had one of the first with pneumatic tires. The sign says, "This is the alternative steel." And this looks like a two-row picker, corn picker. Pick it there and then make his way up the conveyor to the back to a wagon. <laughs> this is a little bee with a belly mount cultivator. See, this is a 1927 gleaner mounted on a Fortson tractor. So this would have been one of the earliest ones. If gleaner is 100 years old, that would put it in 1923. So this one was only about four years after the company started. They were making this contraption mounted on a tractor. So you got to sit inside that jungle gym over there. At least you could operate just looking forward. And you're not driving over anything to uh, harvest the crop. You're you're driving on the stubble all the time. So I guess it was a good idea. Later on, they moved to actual full-blown self-propelled, like that fellow there. I'll go take a look at them. So these self propelled were much later on, so this is 59. So other than the fact they're a lot smaller, you can see it kind of resembles a modern combine. Well, this guy looks familiar. So it's a gleaner. Gleaner Baldwin. And I think this is before L. Chalmers bought them. Yes, it became Alice in 1955, but this was a 1930 pull type combine. Well, there's a there's a photo of it in the field. However. Why, well, yeah, because the header was off to the side. You would tow it here with whatever you had to pull it with. It had its own engine there for powering the combine itself. Header would go off to the side. Crop goes up into here to get thrashed. Straw goes out the back end. Grain goes way up into there in the tank. And then there was no unload auger. It was just a, a door and a chute, and you open the door and out pours the grain into a wagon or whatever a bag. I'll try to find it. I'm pretty sure I have footage of, I don't know if it's this exact one, I think it was, of this thing running in the field. I'll, uh, I'll put some of that footage in there if I can find it.
This fellow here is a Model E. That one's pretty clear to see. Another one without a cab, just the platform. There's open air. All the dust right in your eyes. Here we got some tillage equipment. Got a little cultivator here, got a little plow. There's a lot of stuff. This is only one building. So all these gleaners, various pull types and some self-propelled, they occupy most of this first building. But if you look out the door, it's kind of bright in the sun, but there's actually a second building right there and there's a, a hallway joining them. So I'll go there next and see. Here's some little planters. There's a sickle mower. There's a disc. There's a bigger disc back behind there too. Yeah, it's an auger. That's like a post hole digger. Huh. They actually had quite the, uh, this looks like a greater blade here. They actually had quite the variety of, of implements you could get. I didn't know they actually made uh, hole diggers. I thought that would have been all by hand, but no, apparently they did. That you could get that for your tractor. And this here, this is this is actually not part of a combine. This is a swather. So this is pulled by a tractor. And is it ground drive? I'm going to say this. This is ground drive. So this tire turns turns everything else there's your, your knife your sickle knife on the front your reel and then your canvas and then that will just drop the crop into the opening and leave it for a combine to come along with a pickup header later on so yeah there's no there's no PTO you, you could pull this with a horse in theory and it would work and here's another Waukesha engine same company had that uh, Waukesha on the tractor out front there, but this is on a Curtis combine, and I believe Curtis was purchased by Gleaner. So this is uh, this is another deal where the the, the the drawbar could be pulled by whatever you had. It had its own engine for powering the combine itself, but it, it's mirror opposite from that other one that I showed you over there, that Gleaner one. The Curtis one, the, the header was out to the right side. Which would make a lot more sense if you're driving down the road, you're not sticking your header out in the middle of traffic. I know that both of these, within recent history, have ran in the field. Um, I don't remember being involved, although somebody showed me a picture and I was standing on this one. So I guess I was there when it was running. And I'm pretty sure the other one, like I said, I have footage of that. I'll try to find it. Yeah, here's Curtis Combine, 1930. Only known working Curtis Combine in the world. Oh, produced by Curtis Baldwin. That's right, he was a brother. He was a brother of the Baldwin Gleaner family. And then, yeah, here, Curtis Baldwin, his fathers and brothers, designed to produce the first standing grain harvester and then the various Gleaner Baldwin pull type combines from 1910 to 1929. Purchased by Alice Chalmers in 1955. Curtis left the company to start on his own. So coming from this building, there's an adjoining building. And in here we have some Alice Chalmers books and signs. And there's a toque and hats and hard hats and random other accessories. <laughs> what is this? Terra Tiger. 1965 to 1970. There's also some, looks like some company uh, marketing material. There's the cutaway diagram of a cleaner. That's the N series, I believe. Yeah, N series rotary. There's some toys that are in here too. Oh, there's a toy of the D21.
So they got the whole series back from Rumley. All the way going forward to the newer ones in the 50s and 60s. And an Ellis Chalmers chainsaw. I bet you the thing weighs a ton, but looks cool. Ellis Chalmers battery as a bookend. And a little mini bike. Oh, this is something that's interesting. This sign here. That was their factory on one side of the street was their offices and the other side of the street was their manufacturing uh, facility. And this sky bridge went between them and then that sign was on both sides of the sky bridge. One of those signs that was on the factory is actually the sign that's on this building now. So that sign you see outside that goes between these two buildings of the Al Chalmers building here in Fort Lorraine Museum. That's actually that sign right there, or one of them. There's one on each side, I'm told. But that exact sign is here now. So this is the, I guess you call it the first building. We kind of went in it from the far end. As you come in here, there's an entire other shed. It's about the same size. And this is full of a lot more. And this is more of the Alice Chalmers tractors. And Alice Chalmers also manufactured their own types of pole type combines. They had these all crop series. They have a few different models of them. This is a model 90. So 1958. So they actually already owned Gleaner when they were making this one. Eventually they gave up on these all crop combines and they just went with Gleaner. But they actually had a, a few of them. They were kind of weird. They, they, they kind of went sideways. The crop came up there and then it went sideways and discharged the straw on the side. It was uh it was different. It was like an L-shaped kind of design instead of like a straight line. This is a little L crop 40. This one did not do that L-shaped thing. This one pretty much went straight in and, and up and out the back and the grain was on the side. Kind of like more traditional kind of combine. But these other ones, they kind of came in on the side. Got thrashed back there. The straw turns the corner and then it comes out over here. So a little bit of a different idea. And we have forage harvesters. This is getting into the 70s here. This is 1972. And the rotor balers. These were little round bales. Like small enough you could like pick them up, I'm told. I never personally uh, handled them. This one's 1958, so this one is older. Oh, this one has a little feedback conveyor, so when you had to eject a bale, the idea was the straw would just re-divert, or the, sorry, the hay or whatever you're baling, would re-divert back to the front and just go right back in again so you didn't have to actually stop your forward motion. I'm told the problem was if you're in a very thick swath, it was too much for the baler to sort of handle. But that was kind of the idea that while it was wrapping, your hay would just loop around to the front. Continuous operation, non-stop baler. Only 1,500 units were produced, all in 1958. Many were returned to the factory or converted to the standard stop-and-go balers. This one still has the uh, still has a little unit on it. They got, oh, this one has its own engine. See that you, you think at first there's like multiples, but actually, if you look close, every piece in here. Is usually here because there's something a little bit unique about it. So this was 1948. It made 36 inch bales, 18 inches in diameter, which were about 50 pounds, up to 24 inches, which were 80 pounds. Uh, used to binder twine. So this one had its own engine. And this yellow one, I'll try and read the sign, it's kind of far away, but it looks very, very similar. Like here's an Alice Chalmers rotor baler. Here's this one. This is a Lubin baler. Apparently, uh, the round hay bale concept was invented by a guy named Lubin of Lincoln, Nebraska in 1910. So he developed the first stationary model and then a field model. And I'm guessing at some point, Alice Chalmers bought the patents and then they started making, uh, making those guys over there. Now here's another D21. So this one doesn't say Series 2, so this might be the first Series, but this is just a regular one. This does not have a front wheel assist. So there's what the regular 
axle looks like. And yeah, look at the... It's got the smaller tires. You can see there's actually some clearance here. The other one, the tires are right at the fender. Another little Model B, but this one looks like a... Oh, it's an industrial B. It's an IB. So it's shorter and narrower than the B farm tractor, but it's the same weight. So I guess it's meant for getting into smaller, smaller working spaces. Oh, there's, is this a B? This looks like a B. I could be wrong. But yeah, look at the height difference. And here's a couple swathers or wind rowers. This one, the canvas is missing, but the same idea. Knife, reel, push it onto the canvas. Side discharge here. Here's the same thing, just in a bigger format. Kind of get, kind of get it all in there. It's a little Model G, 1948. And the engine was on the back. So you can't really see it from here, but it's kind of behind the operator seat. And the idea was all your implements were belly mount. They're all in front. So the operator can see what he's doing. So obviously a small tractor, but uh, I guess that's why it's popular in smaller farms or orchards. You know, you're, you're not uh, you're not having such a hard time getting around trees or whatnot. Those are discers. Alice Chalmers discers. So these you would use to plant, but you could also use them for tillage because uh, they're basically a one-way disc gang. 1960, a 15-foot cutting width with seeding equipment and automatic transport. Here's some other D-series tractors. This is the D-15 diesel. There's a little D-10. And then this is going back. You've got some WDs on this side. They were older. Oh, this is a Model U. 1934. Model U became the first tractor ever equipped with rubber tires. Well, there you go. So this is right around, oh yeah, here's a steel wheel. There's the move to rubber. Was used by pro race drivers to set tractor speed records. Included the fastest half mile lap set at Brandon, Manitoba. All-time speed record, which still stands, set by Abe Jenkins on the Utah Salt Flats at 67.877 miles per hour. Tractors used for racing were set up just like this tractor. So this tractor here, or one like it, appeared like it, almost 68 mile an hour speed record. Huh. I don't know if I'd want to go that fast on this guy, but someone did. What I like about this museum, or this collection in particular, most every machine does have a sign on it. So this is a Model A. It, uh, I can tell you just from looking at it, it looks a lot bigger than the U, but sort of similar styling, but a lot bigger. 1936, so around the same time though. But every every piece has a sign so you can sort of read the history. You don't really need anyone to explain stuff. You can walk through yourself and and still kind of get a very good idea about what you're looking at. That's a green Alstromer, a three-wheel. First tractor manufactured and sold by Alstromers in 1917 two-cylinder opposed engine. It burns gas or kerosene. Huh. Oh, I was about to leave and I didn't notice these guys. Look at this little guy. Little garden tractor. Little Alstomer 610 garden tractor. That's cute. I like that. It's got, it's, I don't know if you can really tell that it looks small even by garden tractor standards to me like like i get my hand on that like like it's 
the, there's the span of my hand. I can go halfway across the. Got a little catcher. They got little walk pine snowblowers back there. A tiller. Some more tillers. Oh, they got a push mower too. And is that a pressure washer? And an electric motor. Made in Canada at St. Thomas, Ontario. So it worked its lifetime in a portage feed mill. He did custom feed grinding as well as preparing and selling feed to portage area farmers. When the feed mill closed, the motor was removed to the BCP Growers Plant, where it worked for a short time. Apparently, all farmers made like agriculture is only one business that they were into. They were into a lot of uh, industrial stuff and power generation. They made power turbines and steam plants and stuff like that too. I am not an expert on the subject, but they actually uh, made a bunch of stuff. I've seen an Els Chalmers refrigerator, so that's how weird it got. So here is the Els Chalmers sign spanning the two buildings. So that is the sign that was on their headquarters, uh, I believe somewhere in, it was in uh, Wisconsin? Don't quote me on that. I read it before and now I forget where I, I, I said the headquarters were. But anyways, that was on the skywalk between the offices and the factory. Now it's here. Okay, that's it for, uh, I guess this is part one of my videos on the Fort Lorraine Museum. This is the Alice Chalmers stuff and the Gleaner stuff. And this is all sort of one museum with the Fort Lorraine. So this is all the same property. So one admission basically gets you into the whole thing. But there's too much to cover in a single video. So this video was just the Alice Chalmers, the farm side of the world. But uh, just over that way is the whole rest of the museum here where they sort of have a bunch of stuff from the fur trading era all the way up to sort of uh, modern times, like back into uh, World War II, kind of into the 50s. So if you want to check out more of this museum, just uh, find that video on my channel. I'll get that one up here pretty soon after I get this video up. Um, yeah, this is the Fort Lorraine Museum. This is in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. It was uh, a good day, but uh, it was $10 to get in for the whole day. Pretty cheap. I think it's less for kids. and They might even have uh, group rates too if you're bringing a group of people. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you liked the video, go check out the other one. And uh, hit a like, subscribe if you like. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.